morning, my good friends. I hope you had a wonderful weekend. Second Corinthians chapter 6 is what we will cover today. But before we dive into that, let us pause for a moment and have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we, your children, thank you for giving us another opportunity to gather together to study your word. We always desire to come in your presence so that we can be taught by your Holy Spirit. Because the entrance of your word gives us light. It gives us understanding. Your word is like a, a lamp onto our feet. And the light onto our path. We pray today that by the Holy Spirit of God that he will teach us what we are about to study today. Give us clarity and understanding is very, very important. Help us not only to understand, but to be doers of what you will teach us today. Father, we pray that you will help us not to be unequally yoked together with anything that uh, do not have the same convictions and faith that we have in Jesus Christ. We are very grateful for everything that you've done for us. And we say not unto us, not unto us, but unto your name. We give all the glory, honor, and power, and majesty, and dominion in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. My good friends, today, we will continue our journey through the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. So we will cover chapter six. Remember that um, the first uh, epistle of Paul to the Corinthians was a corrective epistle, which means uh, he wrote that letter to make certain corrections in the church. But this second letter, there are a uh, few reasons why he wrote this letter and uh, we've already gone over them before but I will uh, refresh your memory. He wrote this letter to encouraging the saints at Corinth to welcome back a brother. Now a brother who was uh, involved in uh, sexual immorality and he was ostracized from the church just as a church discipline. So Paul wrote to encourage them to bring him back because uh, he, now he has repented so that he's not overwhelmed with his sorrow. Another reason is to enlist their help for the church at Jerusalem. So the church was going through uh, a difficult time. So Paul wrote so that they can uh, help them out financially. He also wrote this letter to defend his apostleship because there were some Judaizers who did not like the first letter that Paul wrote, so they went about uh, damaging his character. They were saying that he was not uh, an apostle. So Paul wrote to make this correction to defend his apostleship. He said that we conducted our uh, teaching in sincerity and honesty. And uh, we live by example while we were there with you. Another reason Paul wrote this letter is uh, uh, to explain to them the reason why he did not visit them as he promised. Paul promised to visit them, but he did not show up. And uh, he explains to them that uh, the promise he made to them in the first place was not based upon his own will, but it was based upon the will of God. Paul also wrote this letter to encourage us through his trials and his uh, 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 tribulations. Uh, it, it, we can call this letter a personal journey or a personal diary of Paul because he, he shared with us uh, areas in his life, so many things in his life where he, he went through trials and tribulations and uh, God delivered him. So he encourages us not to give up because while we are in this world, we're going to go through trials and tribulations, but we must be of good cheer 
and trust in God because the same God who delivered Paul will also give us victory. Last week, Paul uh, tells us that uh, anyone who is in Christ now is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And uh, he says that uh, we are now reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Because we are now reconciled, he wants us to tell everyone about it. So he tells us, go to the whole world and tell them about this reconciliation. Because we are now made ministers of uh, reconciliation. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what we left up uh, last week. And we will pick it up uh, from there. So in verse 1, we then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So here, uh, Paul reminds us about uh, our calling. That God has called us to be ambassadors for him. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation to tell the whole world about uh, Jesus Christ and salvation that comes only from him if we put our faith in what he did for us. But he says something here even more. He says that we are workers together with God. Not only that we are working for God, but we are working together with him. What does that mean? It means that the power of God flows through us. That we are equipped by the power of the Holy Spirit because uh, we are in this together with, the, with God and the Spirit of God. So the message that we preach is not our message. It is a message of God. Because he is the one who empowers us. Remember, whoever God sends, he will give them what is necessary to be successful. So it is a very exciting pursuit to discover your calling. It is a very rewarding and fulfilling. In the sense that uh, because of uh, uh, what we do, through our words and through our actions, we are now able to change the lives of many people. We are able to take people from the place of darkness and bring them to the place of light. We are able to take people from their destination towards hell to destination towards heaven. So God is the one who empowers us to do this. So we are in this together with him. Never forget that. Because the strength is not your own strength. And the ability will never be your own ability. But it is God who is always at work in us. Both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And because of that, we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. So Paul continues to say that we should not take the grace of God in vain. What is he talking about here? We should not take the power of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, the salvation of God in vain. Remember that Paul is already talking to people who are in the church, who are supposed to be born again. Remember what I said, who are supposed to be born again. So he's talking to them. So let's break it down this way. Paul is talking to two different groups in the church. Not outside the church, but in the church. Now, group number one. These are people who are already born again, but uh, they are not uh, uh, conforming. Uh, they, they are conforming to the image of this world. So they are not renewing their minds with the word of God. They are not doers of the word of God, if we well, let's put it that way. So Paul is telling them that uh, 
Do not take the things which God has made available to us in vain. Don't take it for granted. Now, the second group that Paul is talking about here are church members who are not born again. Now, don't assume that everybody you see inside the church is a Christian. No, no. Not everybody you see in the church is born again. And uh, let me give you three reasons why people who are inside the church are not born again. Reason number one, because of wrong teaching. There are some denominations who have taught people inside the church that uh, Jesus Christ is not enough for salvation. There are other things necessary for salvation. And they will uh, talk about baptism. They will talk about uh, uh, confession. They will talk about good works. In other words, they are, mixed, they are mixing grace with works. So they, they're saying that uh, uh, Jesus Christ is not enough, so you have to do more to be saved. In uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 tells us, it is by grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Least anyone should boast. It tells us that the only thing, the only one necessary for salvation is Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ in John chapter 14 verse 6 will say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But in some places, they still preach this from the pulpit, telling people that they need things, extra things to be saved apart from Jesus Christ. That's the reason number one. Now, reason number two, if you're writing notes, is because of ignorance. So there are people who come to church, you know, they don't understand how to be born again. So for them, they believe that if you show up, if you come to church, and you do the church activities and the rituals, you are a, a Christian. So this is because of ignorance. So they don't know. But it is not so. Going to, to attending church services does not make you a Christian. Just like if you go into your car garage, you don't become a car. Or just like uh, going to a coffee shop does not make you a police officer. You, make, you must make a commitment. A commitment that is very clearly stated in Romans chapter uh, 10, verse 9, and also verse 10. He says, uh, if you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For by heart, men, by faith, men believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So it tells you how to be saved. You must make that commitment, and you must have a relationship with Jesus Christ, not to works, but faith in him and what he did for us at the cross. Group, reason number three is unpersuadableness. Unpersuadableness means there are people in the church. I mean, they come to church, but uh, they have not made the commitment yet. Maybe <clears throat> they are in the church because their parents made them to be there. You know, daddy says, you must come to church with us. So they go every Sunday with daddy. And uh, every time... Uh, 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 they, 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 they give an altar call, <clears throat> they don't respond to it. Or even when they respond, they don't believe it. They just do need to get somebody off their back. So they keep procrastinating. They've heard about the good news. But instead of making a commitment, they are procrastinating. They are putting it off. And you know that procrastination is not a good thing. Why? Because tomorrow is not guaranteed to us. We do not know what it might bring. So even in the world, worldwide, about 150,000 people died today. And remember, if these people were procrastinating, means they went to hell. So it's not a good thing for anyone to procrastinate. That is why he says, the day that you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. 
that uh, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, Paul will quote from um, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 8. Now, remember that um, uh, uh, the whole uh, book of Isaiah talks about uh, uh, three or four servants of God. In Isaiah, uh, Jesus Christ is called the servant of God. The servant of God in the saying that uh, he brought uh, salvation not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles, to the whole world. Not only that, um, <clears throat> Israel as a nation is called the servant of God. Because uh, uh, they represented uh, the, the word to God. And uh, Isaiah himself also is called a servant of God. And uh, because Isaiah delivered the message, the message of God to the people. He was the instrument that God used to deliver his message. Not only Isaiah, but uh, Cyrus was also called a servant of God. Because now God will use him to uh, lead the people of uh, Judea who went into captivity in uh, Babylon to go home, back to Israel, their nation. So here Paul will quote uh, Isaiah 49 verse 8. And uh, we already read it in here. So he says, he says, in acceptable time, I have had you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. So here he's talking about Jesus Christ, that God is faithful. Remember, Isaiah prophesied about 700 years before Jesus Christ came. So in uh, about, about 700 years, God promised Israel through Isaiah, I will send you the Messiah. I will bring Jesus Christ, my servant, to you, not only that he will come for your salvation, but also for the salvation of the whole world. So what do we glean from here? We glean that God is a faithful God. Whatever he says, he will do. For God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should repent. For what he says he will do, he will do. So God will always uh, watch over his promises to make them good. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse, um, verse 3. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God. In much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in uh, imprisonments, in torments in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God and by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left hand, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. <laughs> Glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, what is Paul saying here? He's saying that uh, we, we are very careful the way we represented Jesus Christ to you. We did not uh, live a compromised life. So he says, we were not a stumbling block to anybody. Rather, we were a stepping stone to many. To many. So remember that uh, our testimony will produce two results. It will either produce a result of uh, being a stepping uh, stone, which means it will help someone find Jesus Christ. Or it will be a stumbling block. It will hinder someone from uh, uh, coming to Jesus Christ by 
our words and our actions. Sometimes Christians are the biggest obstacle to unbelievers coming to faith in Christ Jesus. Have you thought about it? Because Christians who are not living up to uh, what they say, living up to the word of God, are bad influences to unbelievers. Now, the unbelievers don't want to be like them, so they are already like that already. They are not doers. So what, how are you going to be able to convince them to come to Christ if you are not a doer of what the word of God says? So that's what Paul is saying here. Remember uh, Prophet Nathan, uh, when he went to David, after David sinned with uh, Bathsheba, he told David, by your deed, you have given an occasion. You have given an occasion for the enemy of God to blaspheme God. By your deed, you have given the enemy an occasion to blaspheme God. So here, Paul continues to talk about his uh, trials. He listed so many of them here. <laughs> I don't know if you can list all of these things <laughs> as what you have suffered being a Christian. I don't think any of us will be able to list all of this. But here, Paul gives us the list of uh, uh, his trials, his distresses, tribulations, as he preached the gospel to to, 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 to unbelievers. But not only that he gives us these uh, challenges that he went through, he also gave us the, the, the solution, the weapons that uh, made him successful in this uh, area of uh, uh, preaching the gospel. So he tells us that uh, Regardless of all this thing that he went through, I'm not going to read them again because we just read all the trials here. But he says, God was able to deliver me through the knowledge of his word by me walking in love, in tolerance, in endurance, in patience towards other people, and uh, above it all, by the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so you see, this rest is not to the swift, and this battle is not to the strong. It's not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but it's God that shows mercy. So we understand that even while we go through our trials and tribulations, we must understand that we have a helper, the Holy Spirit of God, who is always helping us to overcome. The Christian life that we have been called to live is not a, a flowery bed of roses. Challenges will come, trials will come. Jesus Christ made it very clear to us when he said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. And Paul will even say it in a different way. Those who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But because we have the helper in us, the Holy Spirit of God in us, we must uh, 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 receive whatever comes our way with joy. James will tell us to count it all joy when we go through diverse temptations. And uh, in Romans chapter 5, uh, in Romans chapter 5, um, uh, 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 Paul will tell us that we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation will produce uh, patience, and patience will produce character, and character will produce hope. Let me show you something that he said here that I, I am very excited about. He says, uh, uh, we are recognized as having nothing and yet possessing all things. What is Paul talking about here? Even though we may suffer lack, we may suffer want, and uh, we, we don't have everything that we maybe want to have, 
But we have the greatest of it all, which is eternal life. Have you thought about it? Eternal life is guaranteed to us. Heaven is our eternal home. We are citizens of heaven. So even though we don't have things here on the earth, <laughs> we possess everything. And again, he says here, unknown. He says we are unknown and yet well known. What is he talking about here? We may not be known as celebrities. <laughs> you know, the celebrities of this world. <laughs> we may not be popular. <laughs> but you know what? Yet, we are known in the kingdom of God. Our names are not blotted out from the Lamb's book of life. It's a thing of joy to remember. I may not be a celebrity, <laughs> but my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And that is the thing that can give you the greatest joy, knowing that you may not be popular here, but there is a place where you are known. And that place is the kingdom of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are now in verse 11. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now, in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. So Paul talks about his relationship with uh, the Corinthians. He's saying here, he said, I have loved you with a genuine heart. I had nothing uh, uh, back from you. You see, I was sincere and transparent in our relationship. The problem is not from me, but the problem is from you because you have opened your heart to listen to the Judaizers. You have embraced outside influences. And now you departing to do the things which I did not teach you. So Paul encourages them to, he says, come back. Listen and be doers of those things which I have taught you. What principle do we get from this? A very important principle. And that is, the word of God is supposed to be the final authority in our lives. It is not human doctrines and traditions which Jesus Christ say they make the word of God of no effect. So our question always should be, what does the word of God say about this? We are not going to listen about what uh, does uh, so, so, and so say about something. No, we go to the word of God and we find out. What does the word of God say about that situation? And we make that our final authority. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse uh, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? In what communion has light with darkness? In what accord has Christ with a belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 17, therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Glory, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Here, Paul begins to compare uh, uh, things that are not compatible, things that are opposite. So if I would give a theme to this uh, section here, I will call it uh, outside influences. So it's all about influences. That we should not allow um, anything that will influence our relationship with Christ in our lives, regardless of what it is.
So he continues to tell us here, he says, we should not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 10, I believe, uh, it, it says, do not uh, plow uh, 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 with an ox and a donkey yoked together. So you do not use two, these two animals together when you plow. That's what he's saying. And let's break it further. An ox is a clean animal because it chews the cord and also it has a split hoof. But uh, a donkey does not have either. Also, an ox is a, a is animal that labors forward. It goes forward. It labors forward. But a donkey is an animal that pulls backwards. It pulls back. So they do not have the same temperament, the same strength, the same uh, size. So if you would yoke them together, you will not produce any result. Uh, so by the way, yoke, Y-O-K-E. A yoke is a, is a wood implement that will connect two animals together so that you can use them to plow. That's what a, a yoke is. So you don't want to, you, you, you cannot yoke together uh, two different animals. They don't have the same strength or uh, uh, temperament or size. You don't put them together because one will be doing one thing and the other will be doing another. One wants to go forward, another is one, the other one wants to go backwards. So you do not achieve anything. So that's what uh, uh, Paul is telling us here. We, do, we don't do that. So now, how does this apply to us today in our lives? Here, Paul addresses uh, areas in our lives that have uh, the potential of uh, influencing us in the wrong direction. Some people will relate this solely to uh, marriage. They will relate it solely on marriage. And uh, uh, they will say that uh, we should not marry or date unbelievers. That is correct. But it's, that's not all of it. There is much more. We are not supposed to marry or death unbelievers. Why we should not date them is because sometimes dating someone will lead to marrying them. The reason is this, because you have uh, different uh, world uh, uh, views and different uh, values system. You don't reason the same way, you don't think the same way. So because you don't want them to, con to contaminate you, the Bible tells us not to marry them or to be in a relationship with them. Remember, Paul writes, uh, uh, he says uh, uh, in another epistle that uh, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. If you marry an unbeliever or you are dating them, it's just a matter of time before you will be contaminated. And the uh, 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 Bible tells us that uh, 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 do not be deceived for uh, evil communication corrupts good manners. Another reason why we should not marry them is uh, uh, we don't want contradictions. And because there are contradictions in our values, it will lead to a, a painful and a frustrated marriage. We don't have the same thing in common where Jesus Christ is concerned. So do not say, I am tough. You know, I'm going to marry them and I will uh, uh, convert them and bring them, in, 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 and bring them to faith in Christ Jesus. Don't deceive yourself. Because there is a reason why God tells you not to do that. Because in you, you don't have the ability. 
Don't say I'm going to convert them because you end up being the one converted by them. Don't say you don't know about this guy I'm talking about. He's very hot. Or this girl is very hot. No, you don't want them to lead you to hell because hell is, so, is hotter than both of them. Now, if you have made a mistake, remember, before you came to faith in Christ Jesus, you married an unbeliever. The Bible tells you not to divorce them. Now that you already married them, the Bible tells you to remain with them, to dwell with them. Because uh, you could be uh, a, a stepping stone for them to come to faith in Christ Jesus as well as the children that you will bring forth. So we don't let them go. The only way that you will let them go is, be, is if they make the choice, if they make the decision to leave the marriage. So if they do that, you are no longer obligated. But make sure that when you marry the next person, <laughs> You learned your lesson and you will marry a Christian. Now, the, this principle does not only, uh, 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 does not only pertain to marriage alone, but in other areas in our lives. For example, social media, friendships, business partnerships. You don't want any social media that will that, that does not have your the same convictions and faith that you have in Christ Jesus. You don't want any social media that will pull you the opposite way. You don't want to have friends that will not share the same convictions and the faith that you have in Jesus Christ. You don't want those friends. Likewise, in your business. You don't want to have a, a partner or own a business together with someone who is an unbeliever. Because you don't have the same values when it comes to Jesus Christ. So always make sure if you already made the mistake that you have uh, the majority of the business. So they don't control you or per adventure you can buy them out. It's a very important principle that we must apply every day in our lives. So Paul continues to say, he says, we have to come out from among them. He says, be you separated. Do not touch an unholy thing. <clears throat> That's what he's saying here. Now understand the difference. When he says this, to come out from among them, be separated and do not touch that which is not holy. The word used here is yoked. Like I spelled it before, Y-O-K-E. So, yoked. And the synonyms for yoke will be uh, bonded together, glued together, Tied together, paired together. So you see, it's a very strong word. Notice that it does not say we should not interact or work or have any contact with uh, unbelievers. That's not what it's saying here because uh, how can we bring them into the kingdom of God if we do not interact or have contact with them? Even though we have been called out of this world system, but we are still in this world as the light and the salt of the world. So we must have contacts to be able to minister to them, to be able to utilize opportunities to bring them into the kingdom of God. But when it comes to us being uh, 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 yoked together or glued together with them, that's what he's telling us here. He says, come out from among them. You don't have anything to do with them when it comes to this area. So we see that uh, uh, God has uh, uh, 
he has something bigger for us. He doesn't want us to be distracted or to be hindered from making spiritual progress because we are trying to uh, be yoked together, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Furthermore, here he says that we are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walking among them, I will be their God and they shall be my people. So we are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. What does that mean? We represent the holiness of God. We are the light and the salt of the word. We are the temple where the Holy Spirit of God dwells. And we are supposed to uh, uh, manifest this through our words and through our actions. So he tells us that uh, if, 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 because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God, that God uh, says he will walk among us. He will be our God and we shall be his people. In this place now, Paul is quoting from uh, Leviticus and uh, uh, Ezekiel as well as Jeremiah. He combines them together just to tell us that we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit and God is now walking uh, uh, in our midst through his Holy Spirit that dwells in us. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, I would like you to examine yourself. Examine yourself to see if you are yoked or glued to anything that uh, uh, influences you in a negative way. Anything that does not share your convictions and faith that you have in Jesus Christ. Examine yourself and find out. And the good, the way to do it is uh, the moment you identify any, take it a step further. Break that uh, uh, influence. Do not give it any chance anymore. Break that influence. And while you break that influence, it is uh, uh, very important that you replace it now with something else so that you don't create that vacuum and leave it open. If it is social media that has uh, the potential or is already uh, hindering you from having that uh, close relationship with Jesus Christ, cut it off. Replace it with uh, Bible studies. If you already have friends that are hindering you, cut them off. Replace them with friends who love Jesus Christ more than you do. And above it all, if you are not yet married, I'm talking to you now. If you are not yet married, you make a decision today that you will not death or marry anyone who is not a believer in Christ Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, I have come to the end of today's uh, uh, teaching. And uh, uh, if you're hearing my voice and you are not yet a Christian, remember I said earlier, not everyone who is a member of a church is a Christian. A Christian is someone who has received Jesus Christ as his Lord and as, as his Savior and, uh, and have made a commitment to uh, uh, have a relationship with him and who has uh, let go works because we cannot uh, be born again through works. It, it has to be through faith in what Jesus Christ did for us. That's what it means to be born again. So if you are not sure, if you're not certain that if you will die this moment that you will spend eternity in heaven, 
Then uh, I encourage you to do something today. Settle it once and for all. Jesus Christ tells us that he is the only way that you can settle it. You don't settle it through other means. You don't settle it through doing good things. You settle it by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. There are religions in the world who preach that all roads lead to heaven. But this is a lie from the pit of hell. You cannot say that I do not want Jesus Christ and then you want to have access to heaven. The two go together. He is the doorway to heaven. If you do not go through him, you will not have access to heaven. It's as simple as that. And the Bible tells us, we read that today, that the day that you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Do not procrastinate it any longer. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 22, Jesus Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I will dine with that person and he will also dine with me. You see, in front of the door where Jesus Christ is knocking, there is no door knob in that side of the door. Which means he cannot force you, he cannot open the door by force to come to you. You are the one who is going to open the door because you have the door handle on your own side. But he's waiting, his hands are extended, waiting for you to receive the sacrifice which he has made for the whole world. But you have to be the one to make the decision. No one can make the decision for you because God created you and I as free mortal agents. And he's given us the power to make our own choices so that no one can make choices for us. Even God cannot force you to be born again. So what are you going to do today that you heard his voice? Are you going to still harden your heart? Or are you going to see, make a decision that will change the curse of your eternity? A decision that will take you from the path that leads to hell and take you to that path that leads to heaven. Today is that day. I encourage you to make that decision. I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. If you pray this prayer and you mean it with all your heart, today you will be transformed. You will become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Pray with me now. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe he's your son. He died for my sin and the sin of the word. And I ask you this day, dear Lord Jesus Christ, please come into my life. Be my Lord and my own Savior. I believe that I am now born again by faith, not by works. And my name is within the Lamb's book of life. I repent for my sin. And I ask you now to forgive me. And I receive forgiveness and cleansing from all unrighteousness. Thank you, Father, for this great salvation that you have given to the whole world through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Congratulations. If you pray that prayer, I want to welcome you to the kingdom of God. Please find a, a Bible-based church where they teach the word of God so that you can grow in your faith. The only way you can grow spiritually is through the word of God. I want to thank our partners all over the world, those helping us through their prayers, financial support, and the services to spread the word of God, to reach the unreached, to tell the untold. Thank you so much. If you want to be a partner with this ministry, please go to our mini uh, website. It is www.kuim.org. And uh, 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 you will find ways there to participate. Remember, it's only those who hear the word of God and they do the word of God, the doers of the word of God. They are the ones who will receive the benefits of the word of God. So be a doer today. Before I end today's teaching, I would like to pray for you, my good friends. May the Lord bless you, be with you, and keep you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you a uh, uh, peace. Peace that passes every understanding, even in your trials and in your tribulations. Peace that the world cannot understand. May he give you wisdom. Wisdom from above. Not to make unnecessary mistakes in your life. 
Wisdom to know what to do, when to do it, and how to do it for perfect results. And I pray he will heal every sickness in your body today. That his angels will always encamp around about you to deliver you from every destruction. That he will lift you out of your merry clay, regardless of what it is. And place your feet upon that solid foundation, which is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That he will bless the rest of your week. In the name of Jesus Christ, everybody said, Amen. My good friends, we live in a fallen world. And every day we hear news. So many things that are displeasing to our hearts. But I want to encourage you today. Be of good cheer. And understand that Jesus Christ overcame the world for you. And he has given you the grace to live as a victor in this world. By the power of his Holy Spirit. And understand that surely there is an end. And your own expectation will never be cut off. <clears throat> Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Las kendro ko pragan de shiri yara kura prago de suntela pradeste. Angra deste kukuba ala patot. Mele petete parakete palakata du koloto shukoloto pakalata dikelete jekoloto. Mashanda la prakata diere koso bungo to makentem duroko shuro kubra kata. I want to tell you about my new book titled The Book of Hebrews Explained and the subtitle is The Superiority of Jesus Christ. You know, my good friends, it is very important to study the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. When you do this, it helps you to understand the Bible uh, um, in context with the right emphasis. So this is a commentary on the book of Hebrews. It will be a good resource for you to understand uh, uh, the book of Hebrews. This book is now available on our Amazon and also on our website www.kuim.org. Remain blessed in the Lord. My good friends, I am glad to tell you about my new book titled uh, Receive Healing Today and the subtitle is Jesus is Still the Same. This book is loaded with topics on uh, Bible divine healing. It tells, you, it tells you how to receive healing from God and how to keep that healing. It's going to be a very good resource for you, your family, and even for your friends. This book is now available on Amazon, and you can also find it on our website www.kuim.org Remain blessed in the Lord. I'm glad to introduce you to my new book titled Answered Prayers and the subtitle is The Effective Way to Pray. This book has uh, topics on uh, how to pray according to the will of God. How to pray according to the Bible's prescription so that you can get your prayers answered. It will be a blessing to you. It is now available on Amazon, also on our website, kuim.org. I want to introduce my new book titled, The Book of Romans Explained. You know, uh, the letter of Paul to the Romans is a masterpiece on grace and uh, salvation and eternal life. This commentary book, explains salvation by grace, the benefits that we have in Christ Jesus, both now and in the life that is yet to come. It is now available on Amazon and also available on our website, www.kuim.org. This book will be a blessing to you. I am excited to tell you about my new book, uh, the title of this book is uh, Living in Victory, the things that belong to us. So, there are so many things in the Bible, in the Word of God, that belong to us. And uh, sometimes out of ignorance, we don't know about these things, so we do without. 
So this book is loaded with information, telling us about the things that belong to us and how to lay hold of those things and make use of them now, not in the sweet by and by. It is available on Amazon and you can also get it from our website, kuim.org. And the information will be on your screen. To introduce to you my new book. Uh, the title of this book is uh, Embracing a New Beginning, The Bible's Salvation Truth. So I wrote this book for um, three groups of people. Uh, the first group is for those who are not yet born again. So good information in this book, it explains uh, the meaning of salvation and how to be born again. And then after they are born again, it has information to help them grow in their faith. Uh, the second group is those who are not sure. They are unsure if they are born again. And these are church members. So the, books, the book also explains what it means to be born again. It, may, it makes it very clear. And then the third group is for those who are certain that they are born again. So this book gives a very good clarification of what it means to be born again. Not only what it means to be born again, but it has topics in it uh, that will help a Christian grow in their faith. And some of the top topics in this book are The topics in this book are born again explained. We have the necessity of spiritual rebirth. How to be born again. After you are born again, what next? Who is Jesus? Types of righteousness. Procrastination. The choice is yours. What happens after death? How to be a soul winner? Can you lose your salvation? Can water baptism save you? The Father and His attributes. The Holy Spirit and His attributes. The truth about hell and heaven. So you see it is all loaded with all the information that you will need to grow in your Christian faith. If you have somebody that you've been trying to minister to, but you don't know how to. They are not born again, but you're trying to find a way to speak to them about Jesus Christ. This will be a perfect gift for them. And to that one who is already born again, but you know that they are still baby Christians. They need to grow. They need to have more understanding. It will also be a perfect gift for them. It is now available in Amazon, both the ebook version and the print and the paper print version. You can also get it in our website, kuim.org.